everybody. Welcome to the Straight Out of BS podcast again. Thank you guys for your continued support. You guys are awesome. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you to my Patreon members and my listener support. That's awesome. You guys are awesome. Uh, donations are never expected. So uh, when I ever I get them, it just means the world. So thank you. Uh, if anybody's interested in that, links are in the description. I also have merch that's in the description too. Um, also working on an expanded merch store, but more on that later. And because it's still in the works. And yeah, I want to do a moment of silence for the person still struggling with intrusive thoughts or anything like that or addiction. So on the count of three, I'm going to do a moment of silence. One, two, three. Okay, thank you for that. And without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce my guest for the day. Go ahead and introduce yourself and where you went and what year. Okay, my name is Jessica Gitman. I went to the Cascade School from May 25th, 1993 through July 15th, 1995. I was there for 26 months. And I'd like to just give you a brief history on Cascade because a lot of people have never heard of it. Um, So it was opened from 1984 to 2005. And what happened was most people know what Synanon is. Um, so the guy from Synanon and someone else named Mel Wasserman got together around 1967, I believe, and they started their first, um, drug rehab and it was basically a drug rehab for kids and it was called CEDU. Um, it's spelled C-E-D-U for Chuck E. Diedrich University. (laughs) And, um, it also meant see what you want to change and do something about it. So um, the school cascade came out of that. And um, at CEDU, they introduced attack therapy. They introduced um, behavior modification. They introduced what we call raps, encounter groups, forums, um, where someone basically sits in the room and gets attacked by everybody else, including the therapist, and then yells at the floor. Um, I could go more into that later. But um, but some people who went to CEDU and became counselors there started Cascade. I believe there were eight or nine of them. And what they did is one night they put sugar in the gas tanks of every other staff member at CEDU so they could not leave. These were not nice people. Um, and they left in the middle of the night and they drove up to somewhere called Redding, California, Um And the man, I won't use his real name, let's just say John, the headmaster um, of Cascade, borrowed two and a half million dollars from his parents, started Cascade, took 15 students from CEDU, and that's how it began. Um, It got shut down for many, many reasons in 2005, but it wasn't even accredited or anything for the first five or so years. Um, It was when I went there but I could tell that for two hours. So that's just a brief history of Cascade. So you understand where I came from. Okay. <clears throat> and what was, what was your childhood like? What led up to you going to the program? Okay. Um, so I come from a nice Jewish family. My parents met at a singles uh, Jewish dance at the age of 24. They were virgins, um, completely normal, um, And I have an older brother who's three years older and he's completely normal. I was always the black sheep. I was 12 and 13 trying to express myself. I had a mohawk. I had purple hair like I do now. See how much it helped. Um, So um, Mm -hmm. I, I, one time I had never done drugs or had sex and I was in the eighth grade and I sniffed rubber cement. They found it in my drawer, my parents And they said, if I ever sniffed rubber cement again, that they were going to give me severe consequences. So about a week later, they found rubber cement in my drawer again. And they told me I would be grounded for the weekend. And I said, no, Um, there's a concert this weekend that I have to go to. And they said, yes, you will. So I decided it was Friday um, or it was Thursday night. It was going to be Friday. This was May 2nd, 1993. And 
in, in eighth grade and I got dropped off at school and in my bag was stuff for the weekend. And two of my friends and I were going to run away, go to the concert. And then I was going to go to school Monday um, and be grounded the next weekend. Cause it made sense, you know, why not just ground me the next weekend? Yeah. So I was, I was not behaving very well. Um, so I went and got dropped off at school. My friends and I hung out all day, took the bus, went downtown to this guy's house and eventually I decided to call my parents because I was close to them and let them know I was okay and I would be home Sunday night and they could ground me the next week. And they said, uh, okay, you know, but we need to know where you are and we're worried about you. And I hung up on them. My friends made fun of me for calling my parents. So I finally called them back crying and they convinced me that they were going to pick me up. I was going to have no consequences. We were going to drive through fast food and I wouldn't even be grounded. They were just so concerned about me. They just wanted me to come home. So I fell for it and I said, okay, this is where I am. They picked me up at two o'clock in the morning. I fell asleep in the car. And when I woke up, I was at a mental hospital. Um, at the mental hospital, they strip searched me and checked my body for bruises. I've never been spanked in my life. Um, never done drugs. So it was scary and crazy. I mean, these people were screaming and I didn't fit in. So for a few days, I didn't eat to try to fit in. Um, <clears throat> Hold on. I have a question. They just dropped you off at the mental hospital or did they like, did you like get 51, 51, 50 somehow? Like, I never have asked that question. That's a great question. Um, I'm not. I don't think I was 51 50, but I was, you know, 13 years old or 14 years old. So I couldn't leave. Because what, what's weird that. to me is that you were, you were just, just like sneaking out. So it's not like, you, were you suicidal or anything? No. Nope. So that's, that's, that's just, so that surprised. just strikes me. As, yeah, that's weird. Okay. Continue. Yeah. It was so uncool. So for nine days I was inpatient um, met a boyfriend and started day treatment for three weeks. And they said I was so doing so good in day treatment. They were going to take me on a vacation to San Francisco and take me shopping. And that's like 10 hours North. I'm in San Diego. So I thought it was kind of weird. You know, why are they going to take me shopping? I don't trust them anymore. You know, they've already tricked me a couple times now. Um, but I went and my brother didn't go, which was weird too. So we drove and it became night and they said that, you know, we were going to stop somewhere and sleep and then we were going to go to San Francisco the next day. So um, we stopped somewhere called Redding and little did I know it was like five hours north of um, San Francisco. I had no idea, um, but I had a weird feeling. So I've never believed in God. I've never prayed in my life. And I went into the bathroom and I got on my knees in front of the toilet and I closed my eyes and I said, God, if you exist, you will have me home to La Jolla, California by Monday. Um, I will go to school. Everything will be normal. If you don't exist, then test me. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and um, I went to sleep, woke up the next morning and my parents started driving on this long road with no houses, no buildings for like probably 30 miles, maybe more. And I asked what was going on and they said, well, there's this school, you know, and we have some friends whose kids go there and it's wonderful. Um, it's like being in summer camp. And if you like it, and this is May 25th, 1993, if you like it, you can go back um, in September. And if you don't like it, you don't have to go at all. We just want to show you because it's just such a pretty place. So we drive some more and we get to a cattle guard and we get to a rock that says the Cascade School and it's a dead end. Um, and, you know, the whole way was just a barbed wire fence and no buildings, nothing. So I'm a little scared at this point and I have a bad feeling. Um and my parents go into the office and say that a student's going to take me and show me this, the campus. And I was like, okay. So this girl started walking with me and she was from Hawaii and she was telling me she had been there two and a half years and she'd be graduating in a few weeks. And, um, and I was like, okay. And she said, yeah, you'll be here two to three years. 
and you know we can't wear makeup we can't we talk on the phone every um two weeks for 10 minutes with a counselor listening on um there's there's no music or there's certain music but like if you say Metall- they didn't say the words, but like Metallica or Nine Inch Nails, it's called popping off and you're not allowed to do that. You get in trouble. Um, you can't like pee in the shower or take more than 10 minutes. Like there's all these rules that are called agreements. And the first thing I noticed was people snuggling, laying down on the ground and it was called smushing. And um, there was a male counselor with like 20 teenage girls laying on his lap and laying on each other and I was like I think I'm in the wrong place these people are gay you know and nothing against gay people but you know I didn't understand I was like why are these people why are these adults like having these children on their laps you know these are a bunch of child molesters and they were like no that's normal you know that's called smushing and that's what we do you know and um they just told me a little bit about it. And I told them my parents would never make me go there. And I was just visiting. I was about to go shopping and I couldn't wait. And I still, my gut was just, I I knew I was screwed. And um, so the tour was over and they took me back to my parents and my parents were crying. Oh, okay. Okay. I was going to ask if you were with your parents when the whole smushing thing, but you, are, you already answered it. So continue. I don't think they saw that. I think if they saw that, they might not have sent me there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They had their own tour, and I don't think they saw students. I think maybe they went into the classrooms because it was very beautiful, and there was a really good education. It really was college prep, not the first five years, but when I got there. um, So my parents, you know, now I can say they fell for it, and I understand why. Um. But still, you don't drop someone off when all they need is a hug and have someone fix you and sign your child over to child molesters. So um, so they were crying and I knew I was screwed. And they said, you know, we love you. We'll talk to you in two months and then, you know, we'll see you in six months. And I said, fuck you. You'll never talk to me again. Mom, you're a stupid bitch. Dad, you're an asshole. I hope you both die and go to hell. And I slammed the door and I didn't see them for six months. And I didn't talk to them for two and a half months or something like that. I'm not crying. My eyes are watering. I don't know why, Mm -hmm. Um, but I might cry. Um, So, (laughs) so they just dropped me off there with all these weirdos and um the first thing they did was strip search me and the weirdest part about the strip search was there was a male counselor there there was a male counselor there there were two female counselors there there was my quote unquote big sister the girl who gave me the tour and there were another there were like six people but one of them was a man And I mean, they made me cough, they made me bend, they made me do all kinds of stuff, which, you know, to me, I had never done anything like that. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that it did not seem right that a man was there. And why were they searching me? They took everything. Why are there so many people? Why are there so many people there too? Why do there why do there need to be so many people when they're doing a strip search? You know what I mean? Out of every school I've heard of, Cascade had the most child molesting. So that's my only answer okay. is they were a bunch of chomos and they wanted to see naked people. Um, the guy who was there was actually gay and only likes um, prepubescent boys. Um, and he did molest one girl who was 12 years old and had no chest and, you know, prepubescent. Um, but he actually lives in Thailand now and has been there for 15 years because somebody found pictures of naked uh, Thai toddler boys, toddlers, I'm saying under four years old, and turned him into the authorities. And within a week, he was in Thailand, and he's been there for about 15 years. And he's one of the originals who started Cascade and worked at Sea-Doo. He's actually in some of the documentaries. Um, His name is Carl. I won't say his last name, but he's very well known. Um, So... (laughs) Um, they strip searched me, they took 
all my clothes. They gave me a J Crew, REI, LL Bean, and JC Penny catalog. And I was allowed to order stuff out of there, um, collared shirts, um, tucked in. Luckily, we didn't have an actual dress code um, or uniforms, I mean, but my hair was about this long in purple, but half of it was shaved into a mohawk, but it was too long. I never even wore it as a mohawk. So the next thing they did was shave my head. And I heard this happen to three other people in the 21 years that it was opened. Um, but they shaved my head like they did in Sinanon. And remember, these people came from Sidu, which is directly from Sinanon. So, you know, they were doing Sinanon practices for sure. So um, now I have no hair. I have no clothes. I have no family. I have no makeup. I look like a boy. Um, I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm scared shitless. And after that, um, the first year I ran away three times. One time I got all the way to the phone and called someone and, um, it took me about two days, but they just drive with the van and just wait until you get in the car. And finally you need to get in the car because you need to eat or drink something. Um, so, you know, I never got away. And what I decided to do was I decided to fake it till I make it. I decided to be fake and to act like I liked it and um, do everything they said so I could get out of there because the more I fought, the harder it was. So um, in the first year, we had things called celebrations or workshops or seminars. Um, and I did a couple of those where we had to yell at the floor and pound pillows with socks on our hands blood vessels broke, noses bled. Um, and I didn't have any molesting or issues like that. So they told me I was molested by a babysitter. And later a counselor told me that once a week they would get together and make up fake diagnoses and make up stories about the people if they didn't have problems. Like they also told me I shot up a bunch of heroin, like a girl said in the program. And it, was told to me so much I started thinking I was molested and I did do heroin and I somehow forgot. Um, they used mind control, sleep deprivation, memory implantation, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, so they would call the parents after this weekly meeting and be like, oh, Jessica just got there and we found out that she's uh, bipolar and borderline and you saved her life. You know, thank God if you wouldn't have gotten here here sooner, you know, she would have died. You know, so my parents were so happy, you know, they saved my life and, you know, they're doing the right thing. You know, and if you would have asked me this six months ago, I would have told you I'm a victim and now I'm telling you I'm a warrior and I'm a survivor because I had a conversation with my mother and I had her listen to tapes that I made of the counselor telling me some of the things I'm telling you. And um, my mom cried. She had no idea what happened. She had no idea about anything. Um, they were completely lied to. So um, they also gave me pills every night and everyone else too. And we don't know what they were for. We never knew what they were. Um, and then we had things called forums, but they were called raps um, and they were called the game in Synanon. And what it was, was a person would, you would have to like make up three names and why you were mad at them, like because they took too long of a shower or because they gave you a dirty look or whatever it was. Um, and you would have to do something called indict them. So you would get across the room from the person. You were not allowed to be violent and you weren't allowed to sit next to them. And you would say, Jessica, you know, fuck you for saying you're not a heroin addict. You know, we know that you did heroin and you loved it and it was your favorite drug, you know, and then someone else would switch seats with them and get across the room and say, yeah, you know, and when you did it, you fucked so many people and you're acting like you've never had sex, but we know that you're, you know, lying. And then someone would put like 20 tissues under me. And I wasn't allowed to touch them. And every single person would get across the room and just tear me to shreds, basically. 
Um, and this happened, you know, to a few people Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for three hours or longer, if you didn't follow the directions. And, um, so I would, you know, start at the beginning with no, you know, that didn't happen. But finally I realized I had to admit it. So I'd say, yeah, you know, you're right. I am a piece of shit. And then I'd start yelling at the floor. You know, I fucking hate heroin. It ruined my life. I'm a whore. I'm a slut. I'm a bitch. I deserve to die. You know, and the counselors would encourage it and encourage it and be like, yeah, you're a bitch. Yeah, you're a whore. You know, tell us more. How much do you like to get fucked? You know, it's, I mean, sorry for my language, but truly it was it was really, really bad emotional and mental abuse. Um, so that was three times a week. And then we had these workshops where we had eight of them. And that's when we pounded pillows and yelled at the floor even more and did all kinds of very weird activities. Um, they incorporated music in some kind of brainwashing um, and dancing. And they also had something called a trek, which was 16 days of carrying an 80 pound backpack and a four day solo where you had one granola bar for every day and one bag of trail mix because they wanted you to find your inner child. And if you did not focus on your inner child by eating, let's say, then um, you weren't going to get anything out of it. So they basically starved us. They gave us chlorine and there was a creek and we took the water so we didn't get jaundice and there were trees floating in it. And that's what we had to drink. Um, we had no choice. They also did a four day one in the snow with snowshoes, which was really uncomfortable. Um, there was a big rock that was 60 pounds or 60 feet. And they made me jump off of it. They made everyone jump off of it. And people loved it. But I was scared of heights and I was scared of the water. So I spent about six hours sitting there Indian style refusing to jump. And they were like, you know, you guys are going to get to the campsite at dark. All your, you know, everyone hates you right now. You know, you're a piece of shit. You need to jump off the rock. We're not leaving until you do. So after six hours, I finally jumped off the rock holding the hand of one of my best friends there. And I wanted to jump off it again. It was so damn fun, but they wouldn't let me because <laughs> we were late. So we had to go. Um, so that's, that's the general overview of what happened at Cascade. Now, the second year, I wasn't just faking it. I actually was kind of sad when I left there because I started loving it there. It was like my home and all the people were my friends and smushing was my favorite thing to do. And the workshops were so special that I would never tell anybody what happened in a workshop because you couldn't tell people because they had to go through it themselves. And the music, I loved the music. It was like Simon and Garfunkel, Sounds of Silence. And um, I think the gnarliest stuff we could listen to was the Steve Miller band, which I had never heard of in my life because I was punk rock and that was like hippy dippy stuff. But um, when I left Cascade, I was so upset. I mean, I had to go back to 11th or I had to start 11th grade and I was so traumatized. I just I wanted to be there with all my friends. I didn't want to leave. And while I was there. 13 people that I know of have killed themselves or overdosed. There were about 150 kids at a time and um, 13 of them are dead that I know of and all wrote either in notes or told someone that it was because of Cascade, why they died. And there were four child molesters, all that like different sexes and different ages, including the headmaster who would uh, have parties with boys and have them over at his house hot tub naked and give them alcohol and rohibinol. And there was also a counselor who liked younger boys, more like 14 and 15. And someone even wrote a book called Gone to the Crazies about Cascade. And in the book, it talks about this story, this guy who was in my family, because there were four families and four levels as you went through um, beginning, middle and upper and leadership school so um this guy was spending the night at the counselor's house and it was his counselor um three to four nights a week 
I guess the way it started is they were wrestling and the guy got, uh, the kid got excited. So the guy thought he had a chance and was giving him alcohol, having him spend the night, having him sneak out of the dorm into his uh, house. It turns out that three of the four child molesters lived on campus. So it was very convenient for them because they would have people over. Um, and he, um, the kid got excited. He spent the night a few nights a week. So he finally told somebody, the girl who wrote the book, and she went and told a counselor immediately. And what they did <laughs> is they put us all in forums. So we didn't know what was going on. They called the kid's parents. Who knows what they told him? They gave them a year and a half of free tuition, which tuition was about 50 grand a year. And that's not including, you know, the clothes, medical, everything. I mean, it was more like a hundred grand a year. So they would give him free tuition for a year and a half and some kind of monetary settlement if they did not call the police and let this guy just go on the streets. And the parents fucking agreed. And I'm sorry if he ever sees this, but how can parents agree on that? I mean, I don't know what they obviously didn't tell him what was really happening, but for them to agree on anything like that, I mean, I would pull my kid out immediately if anything weird happened. And the worst part about it is this guy is still on the streets. In 2011, he was found here in San Diego teaching eight-year-olds how to kayak. I have a video of it um, with his dog and someone from Cascade called and got him fired so he could still run the streets instead of getting him arrested or taking it into their own hands. Um, he's still on the streets and I'm still looking for him and I'm not scared to say it. I would like to have a conversation with this man and he needs to be locked up. And so do a few of the other ones. Definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah. did they give you any sort of, uh, physical rule manual when you got there or was it just like the, the, the job of people to show you the ropes? Did they give you anything physical at all? Yeah, they gave us like a set of rules, which were called agreements, um, you know, and the different things in the different schools, like you could gain more privileges as you were there for longer, like many of the schools, like eventually you could date um, if someone else agreed. I never had that privilege because I looked like a boy still, um, but you could um, talk to three friends like one time a month, you could get a letter from them. Um, and that was a huge deal. Um, but yeah, they gave us written stuff and they gave written stuff to our parents. And after Cascade, I saw the difference and they had no idea about any of the molesting. I mean, the counselors listened to our phone calls, even stayed with us on the first visit. So we couldn't tell our parents anything, you know, talk about breaking code silence. I mean, there was definitely, you know, we were allowed to speak, but there was a code, you know, and it was, you don't tell people about workshops, you don't tell your parents about anything that's going on. And it was just understood, like, it's crazy that nobody just rioted or said, you know, fuck this, like, I'm going to tell my parents whatever I want. Because they had us so mentally fucked up that we, we followed along. If you were there six months or longer, you were basically brainwashed. Yeah. <clears throat> How many people would you say on average, if you had to estimate, were, were there when you got there and how many people were there when you left? There were always between about 120 and 160 kids for the okay. whole time I was there. Okay. And I hear it was like that. Um, it started in 1986 from at least 1990 until when it closed. And, and a bunch of famous people were there. I mean, Paris Hilton talked about Cascade for a minute. She was only there for like three weeks and she ran away and got sent to Provo. And a lot of people ran away and got sent to places like Provo or went to Seuss and came back. A lot of people were escorted there, you know, in the handcuffs and blindfolded and stuff like that. Um, my parents chose to do it the nice way, as they say, you know, and kindly drop me off and sign their rights over to a bunch of vultures. Yeah, essentially. Did, uh, how was the food there? 
Was it horrible? Was it bearable? Was it was it good? So a lot of the people say it was gross, but I was a vegetarian. So I think like 10 to 20 people became vegetarians while I was there because they were making me like eggplant parmesan and like spicy tofu fried rice. And, um, you know, I'm not a vegetarian anymore, so it sounds kind of gross now, but um, the food was pretty good. It was kind of like cafeteria style. Like there were like 10 different choices and there was always fruit out and drinks. Now, I think this was just for the staff members that were not sick and for the teachers and for the parents and for the people who came to visit, I think it was a show. Okay. You know, and the education was actually excellent. I mean, we had a swimming pool um, and we had like swimming class. We had a drama room with like props and, you know, uniform, or, you know, we dressed up um, and did actual plays um we had science we had math we had history we even had like a committee called the hope committee that i was on and they would take us to convalescent homes and to see um people like uh, developmentally disabled kids we would go into the classrooms and keep them company like once a month or something so you know here goes here goes the brainwash part of me so so yeah i mean the, it it appeared very, very nice. It was mainly mental and emotional abuse, which honestly, I would rather be locked in a room and starved than what they did to my brain. Because ever since then, I think it was a month after I got out, I tried drugs for the first time. And um, it was almost 31 years ago that I got sent there. And I've had problems with drugs and alcohol ever since. I have 53 days clean right now. And, you know, I've been struggling with it the whole time. And the reason I used all the time was because my parents abandoned me and dropped me off and, you know, sent me with a bunch of child molesters and I got brainwashed and they fucked me up forever. But I can't look at it that way anymore. I have to look at it as only the positive. When we were there, they gave us a negative and a positive statement. And my negative statement was, I'll never be good enough. And that's what I live my life on is, I'll never be good enough. It took me until 2005, from 1997 to 2015 to get a four-year degree. And yes, I do have a four-year degree in psychology and sociology. Funny how many of us became therapists. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, you know, I never thought I was good enough. So I would drop out if I wasn't getting an A in my classes. And I remember my dad looking me in the eyes and saying, when I got a 97% in a whole class, why didn't you get 100? And he was not joking. So I lived with I'll never be good enough for all that time until about a year ago. And then I remembered that I was a strong and passionate woman. And they had me choose two words and it was strong and passionate. So every time I think I'll never be good enough and I want to use drugs and I'm a victim, I think, no, I'm a warrior, I'm a survivor, and I am good enough and I will be good enough and I'm a strong and passionate woman. So that's the one thing that I did get from Cascade is, you know, hope. But if I never went there, I wouldn't have needed the hope. Yeah. <clears throat> What was the hardest part about being there for you and how did you deal with it? Um, I think the hardest part was being away from my family and my friends and missing eighth, ninth and 10th grade. And the way I dealt with it was just, I just hung on as hard as I could and just kept counting down the days and praying that, you know, one not praying to God because I didn't even believe in God until about two months ago, if you want to know the truth, because of my first prayer and what happened. Um, so, you know, I just prayed in my own way. I use the ocean as a higher power and I just would go to the ocean and just, you know, just get, get at peace with myself to the best of my ability. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that to just like ground yourself. 
Yeah. <clears throat> How long were you there? 26 months. 26 months. And did you graduate or you got pulled, right? No, I graduated. Um, I still have the, I bought a VCR just so I could still watch the commencement video. Um, no, I graduated, but I didn't graduate from high school, but I graduated the program and, you know, got my little special book and ring. Um, and I completed it successfully. My parents came, my brother, my psychologist and my grandma from Ohio came all the way out there to watch me graduate. And, you know, I was proud of myself. I mean, when I got out, I told all my friends about Cascade and how wonderful it was, how I found my inner child and all this stuff. And they just look at me like I was crazy and be like, do you want to, do you want to take a hit? You know, <laughs> don't you think he's cute? Like go over there, you know? So finally, I stopped talking about it and just did drugs. Yeah, <clears throat> I got really into hard drugs, too. Um, let's see. So you graduated. What did, did they have like a, a graduate, like a program graduation ceremony? Like, was there like a certain ceremony? Like, did they have a process or ceremony about it yeah. when you graduated? What, did, what, what so, was that process like? So it, depending when you got there, you stayed there between two and three years. So some people left in January and came back for graduation in May. Um, but I got there in or in July. Sorry, graduation was in July and I got there in May. So I got lucky and I didn't leave and come back because a lot of people left and didn't come back for graduation because they realized they didn't want to ever see that place again. Yeah. Um, but what happened in the commencement was there was a choir and, you know, they had like this special, you know, Enya kind of music and um, a guy and a girl would walk down like as if they were walking down the aisle. Um, and then we had a stage and they had like a parent of someone speak for like an hour. And then every year was a different theme. And my year was generosity and a swan. And they had like this really expensive swan statue that they gave to one of the students that was like the special student you know who accomplished the most or something and then each person got up and they would say their name and you know thank whoever it was and then they'd get like their diploma or they'd get a piece of paper you know saying that they graduated the cascade school i still have mine somewhere um and then after that, everyone would hug and they'd have like a little reception and then we left. Okay. And it was over. I mean, some people came back and visited like a couple years later, but I never went back. And when it closed in 2005, it became a, um, a Christian school. And now it's some kind of, it's supposedly they're turning it into a landfill now, which makes complete sense because you know, in my mind, it's just all dead souls and dead bodies and landfill is perfect. Definitely. That's that's like poetic. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> let's see. Fucking, what was the question I was just going to ask? Um, it'll come to me in a second. Um, okay. Was there anything positive about your experience there? The friendships I made. Yeah, um, I'm still, we have a survivor site for the Cascade School, and there's about 700, I looked today, I think 756 members, something like that, right under 800. Um, and, you know, some people come on and off of it, some people freak out, some people are stable, but I joined it four years ago and reconnected with a whole bunch of people and still talk to them like every single day. Like awesome. people in my life now are kind of upset because they're saying that I'm obsessing on Cascade and they don't understand what we went through together. Yeah, you know, no don't. one can ever understand unless, you know, like you, I'm sure the people you went to school with, you have a special bond with because only you guys understand what it felt like and what it was like. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, I remembered. Did they uh, when they sent when they graduated? Did did you have to do like a contract? Because we had to do a life contract where essentially we had to follow. It was essentially setting up the program outside of the program. Did you have to like follow a life contract when you when you graduated? Yeah, um, we had a. I believe it was a 10 day long home visit about six months before we left. And we had to kind of set up like an aftercare plan, like, um, you know, if we were going to see a therapist or what school we were going to go to. And they helped the people who were graduating from high school, which was over half of them, um, you know, get into college. So a lot of people just went straight to college. Um, but yeah, there were like certain rules with my parents you know, that I had to follow, like I wasn't supposed to dye my hair or wear black lipstick or wear wallet chains. But when I came out, I mean, look at me now. I still have the same damn color hair that I had then. Mm. When I came out, I have pictures and I looked exactly how I did when I went in. I had spiked collar on and and everything. I mean, it, all I was trying to do is express myself. You know, I have a 12 year old right now and he's a little bit out of control and I see, you know, where their concern was, I wouldn't do what they did. I would, you know, maybe send him to juvie for a night and see how he felt about that, you know, give him a little snapshot into what could happen or put him in an outpatient program if he, you know, continues to get in a lot of trouble. But, um, but yeah, they had rules for me and I didn't end up following them. I mean, Teenagers, you know, I was 16 years old when I got out. I just wanted to have fun, and I already missed half of my teenage years. I feel that. <clears throat> if you could go back in time machine and not go through that place knowing what you know now, would you do it and why? Honestly, I would still go there. Um the reason I would still go there is because the things that I've seen and the things that I know, some of them are very dark, but some of them like jumping off the rock and having the four days in the woods, I wouldn't trade for anything, you know, even though it was hard at the time, it made me such a strong person and it made me so I can help people, you know, and I've worked with like every population I've worked with um, addicts, pregnant and parenting teens, people with Alzheimer's, um, juvenile gang members, all, all kinds of people. And I don't think I'd be able to help people the way I can if I hadn't been through what I went through. Um, and on top of that, some people might hate this, but I'm thinking I was in the middle of becoming an alcohol and drug counselor, and I'm thinking of becoming an educational consultant instead not because I think educational consultants are wonderful because educational consultant is who told my parents about the school and yeah. how I got there. But if I'm an educational consultant here in California, at least I can make sure that every person under my care does not go to any school like that, you know, and goes to like an outpatient program or a therapist or something different. And then the other thing educational consultants do is they help you get into college. You know, they find the colleges of whatever you're interested in and they help you fill out the applications. Um, so my way of helping the kids these days and making sure they don't have to suffer the way we did would be the only thing I can think of, you know, other than changing laws and doing activism like other people are doing would be to become an educational consultant and just get as many people as possible, get my name out there and just make sure to not let it happen to anyone I can help. Exactly. Well, you have the, you have the degree, so. Yeah, I think I just need like 200 hours um, because I have to know a bunch of laws and resources and then I have the certificate to be able to do it. Yeah, you could also potentially find loopholes in the system. That yeah. You could potentially get new laws so those loopholes don't exist anymore. That's the other thing I'm trying to do. And the third thing I'm trying to do is, um, like everyone else, you know, get these schools shut down, not just change the laws, but just get, wipe them all away if possible. The problem is when one closes, 10 more open. 
under a different name from the same people. So, you know, doing something about these people, which is why I have a couple of tapes and some other documents that I'm not going to release at this point, but I have a lot of evidence and there are loopholes like the statute of limitations here in California is seven years unless you have a new injury. So when I taped this man four years ago during COVID and he told me about the sugar in the gas tanks and that the naked pool parties really existed and, you know, all kinds of stuff, I had six years clean and I relapsed. I started seeing a therapist again. I got diagnosed with complex PTSD. Um, all kinds of things happened. So that is a new injury. So now I have a lawsuit, a civil lawsuit. And the man, I forget what I called him before, Johnny, I think, uh, the headmaster, owns an antique store in Sacramento and still has a lot of money. And, you know, money is always nice um, because I can use it to, you know, change laws and help people. But also, I want you know, the other man off the streets, I want, I want these people to suffer and I want this to end. And the only way I can see getting justice for myself and my fellow Cascadians would be some kind of civil lawsuit, you know, and using whatever I can to do anything possible to make their lives not as nice because, you know, these sick people are very happy. I mean, they, thrive on schools like this and kids like us. Yeah, they do. <clears throat> uh, how, where are you with your parents? Uh, have you talked to your parents about how being sent there made you feel? Have they watched the program? Uh, could you ever forgive your parents? I've forgiven my parents, but I'll never forget what they did to me. So where are you with your parents? Basically, I've forgiven them, but I'll never forget it. Um, so a few months ago, I had my mom watch the Paris Hilton documentary. Um, I think it's called This is Paris, the one where she talks about Provo and running away from Cascade. I had my mom listen to the hour long um, tape of the counselor telling me all this horrible stuff. And she cried and she couldn't believe it. And she kept saying she was so sorry. And she understood why I did drugs and um my parents have actually, I'm 45 years old. They've been basically supporting me this whole time, sending me to rehabs, um, spending literally millions of dollars trying to fix me again. Um, and I was making them pay. I was so angry with them that I was like using at them. I was like killing myself, but thinking I was making them suffer, you know, and um, finally I forgave them. Well, my dad won't even talk to me about it, but I forgave my mom um, a couple months ago. And after she cried and we talked and I realized now that she did the best she could with what she had. And they're really good at promoting and they're really good at messing with the parents and making them think that they're doing the right thing for their kid and they're saving their child's life. So yep. I love them and I forgive them, but I would never do what they did and I will never ever forget or be the same. Okay. And what do you think you needed instead of being sent away? What do you think would have helped you? Just a little room to be myself, you know, a little bit of acceptance. Like, you know, maybe she likes purple. Maybe she wants to dye her hair purple. Maybe there's nothing wrong with that. You know, maybe she just needs a hug. Maybe I needed to see a therapist um, or just, I was just being a teenager. I mean, watching my son and his friends, all teenagers, you know, end up drinking and most of them try smoking weed and sniffing rubber cement and doing stupid things. That's kind of what teenager, what being a teenager is about is, you know, testing the limits and the rules and finding out what's acceptable and not. Yeah, it's just part of being a regular teenager. <clears throat> what was your DOC? Um, well, it started with acid, um, when I was 17, then when I was 19, it was cocaine. Then when I was 21, it was crystal meth. Then when I was 26, it was heroin. And then when I was during COVID, it was fentanyl. And when I just got clean, I 
in my system was um, meth three to five times a week, fentanyl three to four grams a day, um, a little bit of heroin, but it didn't really do much anymore. So much marijuana that I fell asleep at the wheel three months ago for eating um, 5,000 milligrams of gummies um, almost every single day. And 100 milligrams is the legal limit here in California. So, um, and I've been on Klonopin for 13 years. I don't abuse it though, but um, I did abuse Xanax bars and Valium whenever I could find it. Basically, my drug of choice was opiates and whatever you have and more. I mean, I'd smoke crack. I'd do anything. If someone had drugs, I would do them. I didn't care what they were. Did you or did you inject or were you just a smoker? I injected the heroin, but when it came to the fentanyl, I was too scared. I tried it once. It really didn't do anything, but everyone I knew smoked it. No one I knew shot it so it was too hard to get needles and figure out you know the right amount so i just smoked it on foil yeah i i i wasn't in, i didn't injected goo balls that was my thing meth and heroin together yeah back be I never before knew what fentanyl the got, back before fentanyl got into everything back when you, you could actually do that and not die yeah, I used um, to. Now, now it's like no, no. I've been off of that. For, I've been off of our drugs for like over three years. I just smoke weed. I smoke weed and I'm on methadone. But I'm on methadone yeah. too. You're on methadone. I've been Thirteen years. I um, I was on 105 and I went down to 73 in a week and a half, um, just in the past 53 days. And now I get take homes. I had to go to the clinic every day, and that's where the drugs came from. Now I go once a week, and starting next month, I go once every two weeks. Yeah, so, I go, to, I go, I go to, uh, twice a month, and then I'm getting moved up to once a month here soon. But um, I, I just, I mean, it's a fucking cesspool down near the clinic. It's a yeah, it's disgusting. Like, it's like I used to tell come up to if you, you can, like, if you can make it. Yeah, if you can make it to the methadone clinic and back home without getting drugs or doing drugs, then you're usually good for like you're 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 good, because literally that that's where the drugs are. That's where everybody's gonna ask you if you want drugs, even if you told them repeatedly that I've been sober for over three years. Don't fucking ask me; they'll still ask you. And yeah. it's just like I just told you. Don't ask, like, no, I, I have people that I've told you know I'm clean. Please don't come up to me. And they still come up to me because they want my money, you know, because they know that I used to buy like in one day from five different people in a 30 minute period of time because I'd go smoke it in my car, have nothing left and go back and get more. Um, yeah. That's why they gave me a week of take homes after only one clean test, because usually it takes a year to get a week or it takes two years to get the month, which is the most you can get. But yeah. they're giving me another week, um, you know, instead of waiting a few months, it's basically taking me two months to get or two months to get two weeks worth of take homes. And the reason it says on the papers is because the clinic is the most unsafe place for me. And if I go there, I probably won't stay clean as much as I want to. Because eventually people asking me over and over and over and over if I'm in a shitty mood or having a rough morning, I'm so impulsive. I'll just say yes and not think about it. And then fuck it. I already relapsed. I might as well just keep getting high. Yeah. No, that definitely been there. <clears throat> when did you did you just get into hard drugs right after you got out, uh, out of the program or did you did it take a while? It took. Two months. I had never even smoked pot. And within two months of leaving Cascade, I had done acid, smoked weed. Um, I drank since I was nine on and off. But I think I've had three drinks in the past 15 years. That's like my least favorite drug. It takes way too long and makes you way too full. You know, I'd rather just take a pill or do a line or a shot or something quick. Yeah, plus it like makes you stupid. Plus, the alcohol makes you stupid. Like, yeah, it does. I, it I just feel like it makes people stupid. stupid. Like, 
it just make like it, either you, it'll make you like super just like social and just like it, you're you're kind of enjoyable to be able to be around but then on the same token you can become a fucking like a chore to be like i have to now babysit you because you've decided to get intoxicated now and now i have to make sure that you make it home safe because if i don't then something happens to you i'm gonna feel guilty about it so now i'm like forced into the babysitter role when we were just hanging out i hate that i hate that yeah. i hate being around people who drink they just throw up and do the dumbest stuff yeah <clears throat> okay um what was the hardest part about reintegration into society for you what did you struggle with the most as a result of of the program i think just trying to tell people you know i was so brainwashed trying to tell people how wonderful it was and how much i missed my home and you know how wonderful my inner child was and having them just look at me like i was crazy and not understand um so I decided to just be numb because no one understood and I couldn't, you know, just go visit my friends. I mean, I knew two people in San Diego, but everyone else was like on the other side of the country. So um, I think my age was a really hard part, too. I think if I would have gone straight to college, it would have been a lot easier. But having to go to high school you know, for 11th and 12th grade after going through all that and try to be normal was nearly impossible. Yeah, no, I feel that totally. Um, I fucked up my financial aid with my, with, uh, I ended up spending all of my, uh, well, not all of my financial aid, but like a good portion of it on drugs when I was, when I was in college. So that was the same one thing. of my relapses. Yeah. 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 So it's it's a struggle, but I just um, got seven hundred and seventy five dollars like four months ago um, for the drug and alcohol studies, and I swear to you, in one day I smoked it all on fentanyl. One day. Yeah. And I'm not I surprised. Why? I just went to sleep. That was it. Yeah. <clears throat> You like go to sleep and then you wake up the next day and then you're just sick and then you have to start the whole cycle over again. You don't even get time, nothing, no time for yourself, nothing. And even nothing. on methadone, I was so scared of being sick from being sick in the past that, you know, I swore I was going to get sick. So I go to the clinic at like 530 in the morning when it opened and just, you know, have maybe an hour of time and then the people would start coming and I would start getting drugs. And my whole day was centered around using and, you know, finding ways and means to get more, as they say in the program. It really was true, though. Yeah. Definitely. But now I go to a meeting every day, no matter what, no matter how shitty I feel, no matter how busy I am. If I could find 20 hours a day to use drugs and find drugs, I can find one hour a day to go to a meeting and be real. I am curious, what got you back into religion? So I'm not really into religion. So my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes is um, religion is for people who don't want to go to hell and spirituality is for people who have already been there. Um, so my God is like karma. Everything happens for a reason. There are no accidents. Like, for example, with you, I kept seeing I thought it said Lucifer. Morning Star, and I watched that show Lucifer on repeat when I was on fentanyl over and over and over again. And I kept thinking, you know, this guy looks really cool. He's got pink hair. Like, who is he? And one day I just clicked on it and asked you to be my friend. And it was like we knew each other for a long time. And ever since then, you know, you're you're a somewhat close friend to me, and we've never even met. Um, yeah. It's like, that's what's been happening in my life ever since um, 53 days ago. I don't know what happened. I just woke up one morning and looked in the mirror and looked at my son and thought, I've been ignoring him for like a year. I don't even know who I am anymore. And honestly, like, do I want to live or do I want to die? And it took me a few days to decide because I really, I was like a zombie and I didn't, know if I wanted to do all the work to live and I didn't know if I could and somehow some spiritual power 
intervened and I woke up one morning and Alexa started playing a song and I didn't ask her to play anything. And it was called Now or Never by this guy named Caliche. And it's saying, I need to get clean now or never. This is the only time, my only chance. It's now or never. Over and over and over. And that day I decided to get clean. So that was God intervening, having some kind of spiritual awakening. Yeah. And ever since then, I haven't used, I haven't had a desire. I know it'll come back. Um, but I have bigger purposes in my life. You know, what's funny is that I actually, the Lucifer Morningstar is a play off of, it's a, it's a play off of Lucifer Morningstar from Lucifer because I love that show. So, Except for that cat. This yeah. guy. Yep. Yep. Hell yeah. <clears throat> Is there anything uh, else you want people to know about your experience or anything that you might tell a parent thinking about sending their kid to a place like this? Um, I would warn any parent that if you have to sign over your parental rights to somebody and you don't know them very well, um, don't do it. Anywhere that wants you to sign over your parental rights is probably sketchy. Um I wouldn't trust anyone with my child, you know, overnight, unless, you know, it was some kind of nice drug rehab down the street that I could go see them at and talk to them every day. Um, if they separated the parent from the child, no, 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 no. Definitely, <clears throat> definitely not. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And if you ever, if things come up and you want you just like things came up and you remember things just write down a list and we'll do a part two so just let me know thank we'll you yeah and if anybody if everybody's watched so far in the video please make sure you like the video subscribe them hit the notification bell so you get all updates and uh yeah we will catch you on the next one bye y'all <laughs>